Dark Moon Podcast is a horror production, and as such may contain material that is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Fascinated by the dark and unexplained. Do ghost stories set both your heart and your mind racing? Do vampires, wraiths, monsters, and spirits give you thrills and chills? If so, allow me to be the first person to welcome you to the Dark Moon Podcast from Harvest Moon Productions and Casper Design Co. <laughs> The Dark Moon Podcast proudly presents Episode 4, Down There in the Dark. Written by David D. Hammonds. Narration by David Rice. Original music composed by Christina Bryce Dolans. Enjoy. <laughs> Play games down there in the dark, said the old man on Carmichael Street. Every night he'd be standing there. I lived just around the corner, on summer nights when the air was warm. All the children who lived around Carmichael Street would gather for contests of kickball, hockey, endless rounds of hide-and-seek. My sister Sarah and I would join in. I was twelve, and she was ten, just old enough to play, but never old enough to win. On winter nights, when the air grew cold, we'd take our play inside. And yet, if you braved the chill wind long enough to stick your ear out the window, you could still hear the sound of children running up and down the street, shouts and giggles and the occasional crack of a baseball bat. The sound echoed up and down empty Carmichael Street. I kept staring, looking up and down for the source of that muffled sound, but all I ever saw was the solitary old man standing there beneath the streetlight. One night, unable to sleep, I put on my jacket and boots and took a flashlight from the laundry room. My sister heard me moving and confronted me before I could reach the door. "'Where are you going?' Sarah asked. She'd put on her boots and jacket as well and had prepared her own flashlight. You hear them, too, was all I had to ask. Mother says it's just pipes, but pipes don't sound like that. They they sound like pipes. I nodded. It was all the affirmation we needed, and together we walked onto cold, vacant Carmichael Street. Three more children, Bobby and Lily from down the corner, and Jessie also dashed through their front doors to join us. None of them had to say anything. We all heard it. The sound kept us all up at night. But no one would do anything, and we all knew it couldn't be pipes. Any idea where it might be coming from? I asked. Could be the sewer, Jessie suggested. There's no manhole covers. I've checked. Doesn't mean there's no sewer. What about an airplane or or a zeppelin? Bobby asked. A zeppelin? Lily replied. Oh, you could fit a whole bunch of children in a zeppelin. Don't you think we'd notice it, though? For a moment, we all looked into the dark, streetlight-oranged sky and saw a complete lack of any zeppelin or airship of any kind. A burst of logic came from this illogical act, and I said, It can't be above us or we'd seen it. And it can't be in a house because it would stop when the lights went out. So it must be below us. We paused and listened to the muffled sounds. The more we listened, the more sense it made that something was happening beneath the pavement of Carmichael Street. Why don't we ask him about it? My sister suggested and pointed to the old man beneath the streetlight. That's when we heard him say, They play games down there in the dark. 
He said nothing more, just stared down at a slight crack in the sidewalk. Who plays games, sir? Sarah prodded. The old man looked away from the sidewalk just long enough to shake his head. He sniffed an old man's sniff and wiped a wrinkled finger beneath his nose. Is there any way we can make them stop? I asked. The old man shook his head. He stuffed his hands in his pocket, a clear sign that he wanted to be left alone. You've seen them then, I pressed. You know what's down there and you know how to get to it. The old man didn't respond. No manhole covers, but there is a way down there, I concluded. The old man removed his hands from his pockets and stared fury at us children. No, no, he said, and swiped at us as if we were flies. We hurried away down Carmichael Street, but he did not pursue us. He stayed beneath his streetlight and shouted, Go home! But we would not go home. As we all huddled beneath a big blue postal box, all five of us children silently agreed that there was something beneath Carmichael Street, and we'd find it tonight. We found no manhole covers, no hidden drains, just a flat, empty street full of sound. The bridge, though, troubled me. I stepped back and realized that in our city of hills, the bridge had been built quite high, unnecessarily high, if all it wanted to accomplish was to cross the narrow valley. "'What about the bridge?' I asked. "'What about it?' Sarah replied. "'Come on!' I led the way through the overgrown weeds at the edge of the bridge and down the steep embankment. Jessie lost her footing, and we nearly tumbled all the way to the bottom. A shout from Lily and a quick grab onto a broken piece of rock allowed us to hold on, and we managed to get our feet planted. That's when I saw it. A rusted iron door in the side of the brick. It had an old lock on an iron hinge, and weeds grew all around it. I touched the lock, carefully, but the door wouldn't budge. "'My dad has a crowbar!' Bobby declared. Maybe we should go, Lily said. I'll go get it. Bobby ran back up the hill as fast as he could. I pressed my ear against the door, listening, and heard the sound of children on the other side. This is it, I said. It has to be. Are you sure we want to go in there? Lily asked. I want to know what's making that sound, Sarah declared. Bobby returned with his father's crowbar. He pressed the thin end against the rusted lock, but it wouldn't budge. I grabbed hold, as did my sister, and we wrenched up the old iron hinge. The door swung open. A gush of stale air evacuated the dark doorway. The noise had been so noticeable a moment ago, suddenly disappeared. Bobby dropped his father's crowbar and ran, as did Lily. They fled back up the hill, neither bothering to wait to scream or slow down for the other to catch up. Jesse, I, and my sister remained. We all shared a glance. We weren't going anywhere. We trained our flashlights onto the doorway and saw that it led to a narrow hallway cut into the old brick. I led the way. The sound should have been louder at this point, but for the first time since I've lived on Carmichael Street, I couldn't hear the sound of children at play. The cut in the brick led to another hollow. This led to a wider opening, and finally, to a street. Not a mine-like tunnel, nor an arched underground chamber, but a street. It had a paved road and a sidewalk. It had houses with windows and doors. It even had a rusted old streetlight. All that kept me from thinking that we'd emerged onto Carmichael Street itself was the black, black ceiling high above us. I stepped onto the pavement, and the sound of my footfall echoed all around this Carmichael Street underneath. "'Where are we?' Jessie whispered. "'No glass, no wood,' Sarah said. The streetlight lacked a light bulb, and the windows and doors lacked their glass and window barriers." The street and homes were blackened imitations, rather than actual reproductions bare of any decoration or furniture. "'I'm scared,' Jessie whispered. 
I don't think anyone has been down here in a long time. Something down here has been making that noise, I said. Sarah nodded. We crept along Carmichael Street underneath, training our flashlights on every doorway and window. We saw only vacant stone structures. We found only bare street. It's almost like they built the bridge over it, Sarah said. Maybe they leveled it out for the bridge, I suggested. Maybe. Once we reached halfway up the flat pavement, our flashlights came upon the stone wall where the street ended. Unlike Carmichael Street above, this Carmichael Street began and ended quite suddenly. It, too, lacked manhole covers. It, too, was flat. But a deep, deep silence that was not at all like Carmichael Street kept us pinned close and made us very much aware of the sound of our breathing. Let's go back, Jesse said. There's nothing here. There has to be, I said. Where else could that sound be coming from? I'm starting to think I was imagining it. I heard it. Something has to be down here. Sarah said. Look! My sister turned her flashlight onto the sidewalk, where a red rubber ball rolled toward us. It rolled silently and bumped against my sister's shins. We stood dead still. Anybody know where that came from? I asked in a whisper. <laughs> Laughter came from just outside the limits of my flashlight. It came clear and loud, and I knew it was from one of the vacant homes, but when I trained my light on it, I saw nothing. More sounds of laughter came, each from a spot where our lights did not fall. The sound grew and grew, and then the sound of swiftly moving feet. Run! I shouted. Jesse dashed for the exit ahead of me. I hurried as fast as I could, and when Sarah started to slow, I held her by the hand and hurried her along. Sarah screamed, and I tripped. I caught the flash of a red rubber ball bouncing beneath her shoes and a pale hand pulling her into the dark. I screamed, but the terrible laughter and terrible sounds deafened any sound I could make. Something tore at my sleeve, and whatever bravery I pretended to have vanished. In tears, I raced back to the cut, stumbled through the tunnel, and fell out onto the overgrown weeds outside, where I slammed shut the rusted iron door. Something like an inhalation from a giant followed the closing of the door. I panted, crying, and heard something that froze me in place. A single knock. A light sound, like the tapping of a child who wanted you to join them outside. Jesse and I wept cold tears as we fumbled with the broken lock, failing to ignore the sounds of knocking and the light, terrible laughter. We managed it sealed as best we could and ran back up the hill, screaming for our parents. We roused half the neighborhood and even fetched the police. My father and Jesse's, even Bobby and Lily's parents, broke open the iron door when I told them that I'd left my sister behind. I asked that they bring weapons, but they ignored me. Jesse and I waited, hugging and crying as our parents and the police went into that Carmichael street underneath. After a while, they came back. They'd found nothing. They asked us to come with them. Maybe Sarah was hiding and I could find her. We searched and searched and searched. But my sister was gone. For three days we went back into that street underneath. Every time we found nothing but silence. No red rubber balls, no children, and no sign of Sarah. After the three days ended, my parents and the police widened their search. They asked me all sorts of terrible questions, but all I could tell them was that someone had taken my sister. I didn't know who, I didn't know where. After three days, the sound returned. For years, I stayed on Carmichael Street. I always hoped one day to find my sister, or at least to recognize her voice among the many, many other children underneath Carmichael Street. Most nights, when the weather turns cold, 
I stand beneath the street light, and when anyone approaches me to ask about the sound, I say, They play games down there, in the dark. The End Hello, everyone. I would like you to take a moment to listen to these advertisements from our valued sponsors. You see, their support in our production allows us to continue to terrify you month over month. So, if you know what's good for you, you will listen and you will support. Thank you. Following a rabbit down a hole, magical creatures, Wonderland. Alice has come back, but Wonderland has lost its wonder. The Ace of Spades is making it plain, and nothing like the fairy tale Alice remembers. In order to restore it, Alice journeys away from Wonderland, following the second star to the right and straight on till morning. With the help of Peter Pan, Pinocchio, and many other fairy tales, Alice must find the strength to restore the wonder of Wonderland and find a way home. If you enjoyed this short story for the Dark Moon podcast, please check out the dark fairy tale retelling, Alice takes back wonderland or any other books by david d hammonds on amazon.com there was a time not too long ago when families would gather around their radios and get lost in great shows like inner sanctum jack benny and the shadow well you can relive those experiences today at radioheyday.com radioheyday.com presents new audio shows that reflect the bygone era we offer both new material and retelling of classic tales in a wide variety of genres join us and journey into your own imagination at radioheyday.com we hope you've enjoyed this terrifying episode of the dark moon podcast please make sure to subscribe anywhere fine podcasts are served and of utmost importance Please make sure to review our podcast. You'd better leave a five-star review if you know what's good for you. It helps us terrorize others in the future. 